All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I want to introduce Chef Jose. Thanks for coming to Google today. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So let us know about your new book. Is, um, tell us about the book. Uh, the book is called The Latin Road Home, and it's uh, my second cookbook, which I, uh, the first cookbook that I launched was Latin Evolution in mm -hmm. 2008. And the book is really uh, a much stripped down version. It's not, it's not Latin Evolution. It's like the, what, lab, what lab, Latin Evolution became. So it's the, those recipes that really turned into the Latin Evolution. Okay. It's also um, it's a travel log. It's a memoir of five Spanish-speaking countries that uh, inspired my cooking for the last uh, 10 years. Okay. So I know that you have 15 restaurants now. Tell us about how you opened your first restaurant and about scaling so many restaurants in such a short amount of time, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, so my first restaurant, Amada, opened in 2005. And I basically opened that with a, a small business loan, a couple private equity investors, uh -huh. and um, yeah, we were able to pull it together. Um, and Amada had quite a bit of success, and from that came many opportunities. And uh, I just, I also had several other concepts that I had brewing in my in my mind. So, you know, with the opportunities, we looked at ways to develop these concepts and. The rest is history. Yeah, so like I said, you've scaled so quickly. Like, what kind of challenges have you had in scaling so many restaurants in such a short amount of time? Uh, there's usually a, your typical, like, you know, construction and uh, dealing with leases and negotiations, that sort of, you know, business constraints. But uh, for the most part, it's been a, it's been a pretty smooth and easy ride. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I feel pretty fortunate about that. Okay. So do you work with a design team to come up with interior designs? Like how much of an influence do you have on that? And what do you focus on when you're thinking about your next concept? Well, I have a design firm that I've worked with since we started Amada in 2005. They're, uh, they're called Creme Design and they're out of Williamsburg, Berg, Brooklyn. And uh, the chief designer, June Izaki, is now a close friend of mine. We've designed probably 85% of my restaurants has been with Creme. And so we usually would uh, walk the spaces together. We might travel somewhere. So for instance, in order to um, design Amada, we were in San Sebastian and Barcelona and started to really get a look and feel for the, the cuisine and the culture and the different, you know, really, really to capture that feeling of a Spanish tapas restaurant. Mm -hmm. For Distrito, our Mexican concept, modern Mexican concept, we. June and I both traveled to Mexico City, and we brought back some of the, the flash, the glamour, the, yeah. the energy from Mexico City to design Distrito. So those types of travel experiences and working hand in hand with June for many years has uh, given us the ability to design some pretty neat, neat spaces. Okay. So I just want to go back a little ways. Um, how did you get involved in cooking? Um, my. Uh, I always enjoyed cooking as a kid. My uh -huh. mom and my grandma were, were fantastic cooks. They, uh, they cooked great meals for us at home growing up, and it was um, typically an Ecuadorian meal, so I had that kind of Latin upbringing. And uh, with time, uh, I went to two years of undergrad and still hadn't really found, uh, I felt like something that was driving me or, or, or a passion at that point, and I realized that uh, I enjoyed cooking. so. I visited a culinary school in Chicago called Kendall College, uh -huh. and kind of like the minute I got there, I, I, I enjoyed the seeing the discipline that was involved, the you know the white coats, the tall white hats, that sort of thing, and it was just like it just felt uh, right to me. So, are there certain things that your you know that your mom made that you know are just that go-to meal for you or anything, or anything that like kind of really focused you on cooking? Um, I think that there were several experiences that I had growing up, whether it was having empanadas on Sunday watching a, a Bears game. Well, okay. I grew up in Chicago. Um, or having uh, this locro, which is a Ecuadorian potato chowder with, with avocado, a poached egg, uh, pork skins that are cooked into the chowder. Uh, I would say those are two, just two examples of like hearty, like wholesome 
dishes that uh, always bring me back to my childhood and um, have inspired me to this day. Okay. So where are most of your restaurants located? Um, well, my home base is in Philadelphia, and that's kind of where we started. And so we have seven restaurants in Philadelphia. Um, I have a restaurant in Chicago called Mercat a la Plancha. And this year we did a big push, and we, uh, we do the food and beverage management of two hotels, one in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, called the Saguaro. We have a Distrito and Old Town Whiskey there. And in Palm Springs, we have Tinto, which is our Basque tapas brand, and El Jefe, a new uh, tequila and taco concept. See, the reason I was asking why so many restaurants are in Pennsylvania is because I'm a Chicago boy. So how come, are you going to plan on putting more restaurants in Chicago? Or Yeah, we, we really like Chicago. I mean, I get there at least four or five times a year for the restaurant. It's a great restaurant town, too. It's it's a great restaurant town. I've known it for years. We just haven't um, focused our energy on it, but it's top of top of the list right now. And can you tell us some of your favorite restaurants in Chicago? Sure. Uh, I have a good friend who I worked with on the National Pork Board. We were both uh, celebrity chef ambassadors, okay. pork lovers, and uh, his name is Paul Kahn. And he has some of my favorite restaurants in Chicago. He has a Publican. He's got a great taco and whiskey concept called Big Star mm -hmm. and a Vec as well. So I like his, his places. And um, when I get to Chicago, I also, right down the street from Mercat, which is located on the South Loop, I go to um, kind of an English pub called The Gage, mm -hmm. which is just like homey and uh, a favorite. Of course, the Wiener Circle as well. <laughs> <laughs> Best place for hot dogs. Yeah. So when was the last time you cooked for your family, and like, what are some of the go-to meals that you prepare? So typically, um, you know, we, we cook on Saturday and Sunday. When I say we, my wife and I, Beatrice, uh, she's of Cuban descent. So that's our favorite time to, to bond, to kind of, you know, spend some good family time. And so we'll, we'll do some menu planning, and she'll actually uh, do a lot of the prep. So she'll, you know, get, nice. get her board, get her knife out, and like, and then once the prep is done, I'll end up cooking it all. So okay. it's, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, no, it's actually a great uh, team effort. And again, I think a great family activity. And, um, you know, lately some of our most memorable meals have been at our farm, which um, we've had for about two years. It's north of Philadelphia in Bucks County. Uh, it's a 40-acre farm. We have about a seven acre garden which we planted and we were raising we are raising vegetables produce uh, chickens bees growing mushrooms wow. um, and all the that produce is going to the restaurants in philadelphia and atlantic city uh, so some of my most memorable memorable family meals have been there uh, we have this outdoor kitchen and it's just really about eating like super healthy super yeah. light very fresh and um They've been right off the farm, yeah. Yeah, I know. So I love the farm concept that you really incorporate into your restaurants, and that's something that, that we do here. Um, why did you decide to go that route, which I really respect? Like, what was your driving factor with that? Well, to be honest, uh, I was looking for a uh, second home mm -hmm. and somewhere that I could, like, retreat to. And we really, you know, most most people in, in Philly do the Jersey Shore, or, like, head down to the you know, head down to the shore. I, I was looking for something a little more relaxing. And uh, so I looked uh, in Bucks County and I just found a lot of these, you know, farm properties that were available. And we found, it was hard to find the property that had the retreat and the, and the farming piece. And we were fortunate to find one. And so once we got it, it was really just, just going to be a second home. But I saw the farm, saw the garden and my natural instincts took over to yeah. and you know before we knew it we had uh, invested in uh, deer fencing a new well mm -hmm. a tractor uh, an organic farm crew that's there every day yeah. and it's become like quite a quite an undertaking and one that I'm proud of and look forward to seeing the results in the future yeah so how big is it I know you mentioned it earlier but and are there any plans to expand that uh, currently, it's it's seven acres, and uh, we farm. It's a seven-acre garden, and we've produced 
Uh, this year was more of like a, a testing period where we had about 100 different varieties of whether it was peppers, herbs, uh, microgreens. Um, the, you know, the thought was to see what the soil would give so that we had a real accurate plan for next year. But in addition to the produce, uh, we have bees that are producing honey that mm -hmm. pollinate the crops. Uh, and you can use that in your restaurant? could use that in the restaurants. We have uh, these different logs that it's more of a, a log mushroom mushroom farm. Mm -hmm. And we also put in a pretty big greenhouse. So I'm excited to see what we can do there in the wintertime. And the thought is, and, and thus far this year, we've been able to do two deliveries per week into the 10 restaurants. So we have seven restaurants in Philadelphia and three in Atlantic City, which is just another hour south. Yeah. So um, it's been a pretty successful program. And it's also forced our chefs to kind of really be local and really, you know, yeah. get creative with some of the varieties of vegetables and herbs that we were growing. Yeah, so how much produce comes from your gardens that you can use in your restaurant? Is it 10%, 20%? It's probably, this year, I would say it's been about 25 to 35%. All right, and so with the addition of the greenhouse, do you have a set plan of what you want to grow in there or what you're going to try? and? Yeah, well, you know, we use typically, they're some of my favorite micro greens are uh, micro arugula, micro basil, uh, micro cilantro. So we think that, and the, we think that those can really yield, um, we could have a good yield on those. And they're ones that, are, that can be quite pricey as you yeah, start to I, like. I so, um, and then in the spring, we'll probably, you know, start all our seedlings there. But, you know, to be honest, it's a, uh, it's an evolving process, right. you know, and it's, it's an evolving process to find out what the right financial solutions are to making it a, a sustainable farm. So we're, uh, we're under, we're in that, in that mode right now. And um, I'd also like to eventually have goats and make mm -hmm. goat's cheese, one of my favorite cheeses. Okay. And we have, you know, but first things first. Yeah, so do you know what you're going to try to plant next year and what didn't work this year? Um, we had some soil erosion issues, mm -hmm. which, you know, some, when water, when it rained, water pockets collected in certain areas and drowned some of the plants that we had. So, um, we have to fix our, okay. our <laughs> degrade our soil a little better this year, create some drainage. And, uh, so that was a learning experience for me. That was one where, you know, we just didn't, didn't see it coming and it happened. Uh, so we're looking to improve that. And I think for the most part, uh, everything we put in the ground worked. Potatoes didn't work, and uh, we had a rough time with uh, some melons and certain varieties of tomatoes. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, everything we put in worked, and it was, you know, again, quite abundant. We had about a thousand pounds that we were harvesting a week really? at a That's certain point. Really? That's really impressive. Not bad for Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. So, like, uh, everyone always wants to know this. What are some of your favorite kitchen tools? And if you were to like assemble a knife kit that really boils it all down to what's in there? Um, well, I think uh, having, just to say this, having sharp knives is the most important thing. And um, I like, I have a Mac, Mac knife, it's a Japanese yeah. brand, which I really like. It's an eight inch, really like versatile, uh, it could do vegetables. It could you could clean fish with it. It's just really, and I keep it super sharp. Um, so, I think the chef's knife is the most important piece of equipment you could have. A good cutting board, uh, but you know, I'm, I like gadgets too. Yes. So, <laughs> you have a favorite gadget? Um, well, I recently I started cooking more with my kids. I have a nine and a five year old, and they really um, enjoy the kitchen. And again, it's a great time for us to bond so I've set up my kitchen a little more just a little more usable I mean, in the past I really my home kitchen was it was there but you know I cooked in the restaurant so I wasn't really like at home doing it as much but now that they're into it uh, I've bought some tools and actually my KitchenAid mixer is a great uh, what a versatile tool I mean from making ice cream to I could I could do an ad for KitchenAid right now. Okay, all right. Oh, that's great. <laughs> but uh, you know, we make fresh pasta. We make ice cream in it. Um, it's fresh doughs, pizza doughs. So it's it's been a it's been a great tool, and I haven't you know discovered it as as much as I have in the last year. Okay. 
So I, I just want to talk a little about kitchen design. Um, so is there anything that you have learned designing kitchen to kitchen? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, the most important thing is having, having a definite idea of your, um, let's just say professional kitchen, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're designing a professional kitchen, really having the concept and the, the menu down before you design, it's, I mean, it seems like a basic thing, but sometimes uh, if you're doing a new concept, the menu could evolve, it could change, and that will totally change the flow of the kitchen. So kitchen flow is really vital. And um, so if you have your menu in place and really, really thinking through the flow process, mm -hmm. how things are produced and how they're turned out is, um, is super important. So I'm, I'm actually designing like a quick serve, uh, quick serve like Peruvian rotisserie chicken mm -hmm. place. And, you know, the menu, like, at first we were like, okay, just Peruvian rotisserie chicken. And then we thought, well, how about empanadas as well? And then we're like, well, we might want to add, like, beef ropa vieja or something. So, like, you know, the menu has evolved, and as the menu has evolved, the kitchen design has continued to evolve. And as long as before you, you bid it or, or have, uh, have anyone do any work on this kitchen, you have that flow, that's the most important thing. So what do you think the commercial kitchen of the future looks like? Are we going to be only cooking on electric? Are we going to be using an oven? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's, it's pretty dependent on the type of operation and the type of commercial application. Uh, I think for me, I'm, I'm actually in the process of designing a, um, a pretty evolved kitchen. And I have several different pieces of equipment that I'm, I'm bringing in. It's, it's, it's going to be a uh, small restaurant in Philadelphia mm -hmm. of probably only about 25 to 30 seats in which I'm looking to do one seating per night and uh, really turn out what I think is like the most epic meal that I could produce. Right. Um, so in this application, I'm going for a, uh, a island style kitchen okay. with several different types of equipment. Uh, a CVAP, which is a, are you familiar with the CVAP? Yeah. yeah. Uh, a piece of equipment that can cook to a, a specific temperature and steam and, and really just cooks a protein to its perfect temperature. Um, I have a pe uh, piece of equipment called the Josper, which okay, is a, that I heard about. which is a solid fuel encased cabinet uh, style grill, almost like a plancha with uh, solid fuel on the bottom. Okay. So you get you know, wood and uh, smoke. And then there's other, th other pieces like uh, sous vide cooking, uh, circulators, um, just to name a few. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, we really try to incorporate green aspects into all of our buildings and kitchens. Is that something that you do as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think as much as possible, I think, you know, from a sustainability point of view, um, we're looking to incorporate the farm in terms of how we operate. Mm -hmm. So um, right now, all of our fryer grease from all the restaurants in Philadelphia is being turned into um, biodiesel fuel and soap for the restaurants. Uh, the restaurants are also composting. So we're taking those vegetable scraps up to the farm and turning it into compost. And um, yeah, those, those type of sustainable practices. In terms of building, uh, yeah, we're, we're not 100% there yet, okay. for sure. All right. So I just want to take you back to San Francisco. How long are you here for? Uh, well, I've been here. I came I was here yesterday, and I leave tomorrow night. So about three full days in, uh, in San Francisco. And I could say uh, it's been a great time thus far. I love the city. I love the energy of it. Uh, it seems really dynamic. Mm -hmm. And I uh, had a great meal at uh, Manresa last okay. night. Yeah. That's my next question. Yeah. Where, are you, where are you going to eat tonight? And like, uh, what are some of your favorite spots here? Uh, well, thus far, so we made a point to make it to Manresa last night, which was amazing. David Kinch cooked a fantastic meal for us, uh, which was probably around 15 or 20 courses. I don't remember. I lost track. But uh, pretty epic meal, really delicious, really natural flavors. Uh, I was pretty inspired by his, his subtlety. Uh, and is also like unique flavor combinations. Yeah. Uh, and then um, let's see. 
So a few recommendations that I've had. We're going to Quince tonight, okay, which I heard is pretty good. Yeah. And then um, we're going to State Bird tomorrow, okay. which uh, I think Bon Appetit gave it a best new in the in the U.S. And uh, I think Mission Chinese for lunch tomorrow as well. All right. So how's yeah. that list? Yeah, the good list. Good list? Okay. Let me know if there's anything else I should hit. <laughs> well, there's a lot, so okay. you know, I'm sure they'll tell you. Um, I just want to open it up to the audience. Any questions from the audience? So if you have a limited budget and you have a stove, a fridge, you have like the basic but equipment. No pots, no pans, Got no it. Knives, no anything. Well, I think the best place, I know for, for me um, in New York, there's a, uh, the Bowery District, which has old restaurant uh, equipment, uh, things that are used. I mean, those things are, are will last a lifetime. So I think you can get the most bang for your buck. I don't know what's here in San Fran, but is there like a used yeah, restaurant, there, there depot? Is. Are there any specific pieces of equipment that you'd recommend? You got any kind of cookware that you recommend? Mm, yeah, I without think. Without giving an endorsement? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say uh, definitely get a good quality cutting board because I feel like that's like, you know, if, if you have like one that has a lot of surface area, uh, a really good knife, I think pots, yeah, a few, yeah. a few solid like you know, like a stock pot, a really good cast iron saute pan, and um, that's only like a hundred bucks. Yeah, I think you're, <laughs> if you know, if you have a, a blend, aid. you need a kitchen aid or 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 a well, the blender. Aid costs the rest of it then. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think the impact of of media and just it seems like America is becoming more of a culinary culture, and how, how do you think that's changing sure well when I was in culinary school and I started culinary school in 1993 uh, there was Emeril Lagasse Mario Batali Jacques Pepin and they were like the culinary TV superstars and they were just doing kind of uh, they call it in our profession like dump and stir shows where it's just you know kind of a how-to and obviously it's evolved tremendously over the last 20 years. Um, I've seen some impact on food TV just inspiring the youth, where we have, we have tons of like younger fans who are really into, um, into the cooking shows, but also just um, are more knowledgeable about food. So that could only make for um, better eating, hopefully healthier eating uh, going down the road. And um, yeah, I think, I think it's just has continued to evolve tremendously. You know, do you care to talk about your experience on Iron Chef a little bit more? Is it really like pressure intense? I mean, what's it really like on stage? Yeah, so Iron Chef has been, uh, it's been a, an incredible experience. Uh, I won uh, the second season on 2009 of Next Iron Chef. Mm -hmm. um, I challenged nine other competitors, came out on top, but then we started competing on a regular basis uh, as an Iron Chef, and it's been... Um, it's the most fun thing I'll do all year. It's, it's also the most intense yeah. period of the year. Uh, the battles are really, they're tough. You know, you're in, you're in a place that has lots of lights. It's hot. There's fire everywhere. There's a, another chef who wants to take you out. And so I kind of, I, I get psyched out about it. You know, I, uh -huh. I, you know I, get, I get into it. So it's been, it's been a um, great experience. Also, the... The creativity that it spurs during that period of the year has really been great because then we're able to take those creative um, dishes and then start put to them put, on the menu. put them on the other yeah. menus. Yeah, so it's been a, a great period of time. And then so on the Iron Chef, do you always keep the same team? The team has evolved okay. every year. And so uh, the first couple years I had like a mixture of my different chef de cuisines. Mm -hmm. And I kind of rotated everybody around. But this last year, uh, I decided to go with just one team. And it was like a powerhouse team, like my best culinary person, um, Michael Fiorello, my best pastry chef, corporate pastry chef, Jessica Magardo. And so the three of us were really, I mean, we, we were able to really put on a show this year. So I'm excited about this year's season um, as it airs. Okay, so can you give us any hints on this year's season? Or <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. 
Uh, if you want to pay my $2 million confidentiality agreement, I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> I don't, personally, so I'm going to pass on that. If, if the odds are high enough, the lawyers I might go on. Um, about Iron Chef too, like could could you comment about the role of of improv when you create the dishes, like how you practice that, how that's made its way into your restaurants? Yeah, well, I think for the most part, uh, before we go on the show, we'll um, we'll do some mock battles. So I go on the show with kind of a, an idea of what how we can apply these different menus to the secret ingredient, and so and then and then. Lately, there's been some curves that they've shown that they've thrown at, thrown at us at, on the show, and so, like anything in life, I mean, we've we improvise, and it's it's been, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, he's tied to a confidentiality yeah. agreement. So. <laughs> do, you, do you find yourself improving more in the, in the kitchen in, in Philly now as a result? No, I think that your... I, I don't think we do. I think that we're. We're actually planning more and becoming um, more diligent about our development. And I've actually, so with all the different restaurants and all the many concepts that we have, it's hard to create um, and evolve the menus on a regular basis the way I'd like to. So this year we've taken an approach to creating a development team that really helps us push all of the menus forward and evolve. And uh, in our business, which is really competitive and, and tough and always moving, uh, we're finding that it's important to continue to evolve, stay fresh, and uh, that's kind of where we are with it. All right, I have two questions. Okay. The first one is, what is your favorite non-Latin cuisine and why? And the second okay. question, if you were to die today or tonight, what would be your last, your last supper? Mm, okay. Uh, favorite non-Latin. That's a tough one because I'm a fan of cuisines. I was in I was in France this year and had amazing. Uh, I was in Provence and Paris, amazing French meals um, or rustic. Um, I love Asian food. Uh, we've been doing a lot of research on Chinese cooking lately, so it's it's been a huge learning experience. And so that's been part of my my journey throughout all of this is to explore different cuisines, different cultures, and uh, so I don't know that I have a favorite one. I mean, Italian is always, uh, it's a standby um, in my household anyway. We're yeah. big pasta lovers. Yeah, from Chicago too, it's kind of. <laughs> exactly, and so if I were to die today, I think um, if I had a meal that I wanted, uh, I'd probably ask my mom to make her, um, just her empanadas, they're just, they're so tasty. They're good. They they bring me. They bring back such great memories for me. Yeah. So I have a question about when you guys are developing a new concept with your team and you're traveling to a new country. Uh, your book covers a bunch of different countries, so I'm wondering how you guys approach a new concept when you're say visiting a new country. Do you go there with no research and just sort of hit the streets and see what's out there? Do you focus more on the higher end restaurants to sort of see what people are eating, or do you just try to, uh, I guess, wander around and see what people are eating and then find inspiration through that? That's a great question. And I'll give you a great example of uh, how our research has evolved into something that it is now. So we, we opened a restaurant called Chifa in Philadelphia in 2009. It's a uh, Peruvian Cantonese fusion. And we went to travel there. Uh, and I went there in hopes of finding this true fusion. I had heard of it, and, and what I found was Chinese restaurants in Peru using Peruvian ingredients with some Chifa-esque dishes, but we really didn't find a true fusion. And we looked and looked and couldn't find it. What I found was um, several other things. Great Peruvian food. I found a, a gastronomic capital of South America some really great chefs who have really evolved the cuisine there. And so we came back to Philadelphia with, you know, really not much. And, and really we, we took it upon ourselves to do this marriage of Peruvian and Chinese cuisine. And um, with some success, it's been, <laughs> it's uh, fusion cuisine, I would say, is, is a difficult thing to truly master and, and do 
very well and, and for uh, cuisine to be highly accepted. You know, or you, know, you don't go out and say, oh, I think I'm going to have Peruvian Chinese tonight. You know? <laughs> so um, it's been quite a journey, but the research for that was, uh, was pretty fun and yeah, insightful. So do you, like, um, do you ever plan on opening an Asian concept specifically, or what's on the horizon for you? Um, currently on the horizon is uh, Volver, mm -hmm. which is uh, going to be my 25-seat epic. Jose does you know, the best meal that he can. And I really want to bring back this idea of um, high-level service. I feel like it's, mm -hmm. it's, kinda, yeah. it's left uh, for several years for many reasons, and um, so that's, you know, my exploration of molecular gastronomy and how I would apply it to my food is, is what I'm gonna focus on immediately next year. Uh, and then I'm working on a few quick service concepts. So applying what I've learned over the past mm -hmm. 10 years and putting it in, into a form which can be accessible, fast, fresh, delicious. I don't know if you're aware, but California recently banned foie gras. Yep. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that issue and what you would do if you had a restaurant here where you wanted to serve foie gras. Uh, yeah, it is a pretty controversial topic, and there's several, several folks take uh, several sides of the, of the story. I, I would say, you know, currently we had um, a lot of issues with foie gras in Philadelphia as well. We had a, a lot of protests and, and folks wanting it off our menus. So we actually obliged everybody and took it off the menus. And, um, you know, personally, I can't say that I have a problem with it. I've, I've actually, I have a friend who's a farmer out in uh, New York, upstate New York. He owns a uh, Hudson Valley foie gras, Michael Ganor. And um, I know that he practices uh, humane approaches to raising his animals, and so that's kind of where where I stand on it. But we we did take it off just just to keep things keep things cool. You know, we're we're in the business, we're in the restaurant business, and we're there to like feed people and 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 give great hospitality and service. And so I, you know, to be honest, my approach was not really to get involved in in much controversy. Are there any other things that you don't serve on your menu? Do you serve veal? We don't serve veal. Okay. Uh, n not because we think it's inhumane, because it really doesn't sell in, in our okay. markets. Okay. Great. One of the most fun parts when watching Iron Chef uh, is when someone takes a ridiculous ingredient and puts it into an ice cream machine. Do you have any fun ice cream machine stories, either something that turned out to be surprisingly tasty or not? Um, I think we made uh, trout ice cream once, and uh, it actually was pretty good. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't too bad. Um, we're also, I'm not a pastry chef, so making ice cream requires some depth of hand. And I think there was one point where we were making truffle ice cream, and it uh, it overchurned, and it became truffle butter all of a sudden. So it was kind of like that improvisation that you were talking about earlier. Two kids. Um, I was wondering if they have any favorite dishes that you cook a lot for them, or is there, or are their culinary tastes just as diverse as yours? Oh gosh. Um, well, they're um, both of my children. They're nine and five, so they're at that stage where they're continuing to discover flavors, textures, and so uh, you know, we emphasize vegetables and you know eating healthy and that sort of thing and there's always the struggle that, that occurs at the kitchen table and uh, so we cut deals on a regular basis like okay you cut can deals, that sounds yeah, interesting. you can have this but you're gonna have to have your steamed broccoli and so but I think their exposure to all of this is only going to be great for them I cook breakfast for them every morning. It's kind of our, our family time that we get because I'm sometimes busy at night or I'm traveling. That's a part of the day that I always try to connect with them. And so we have full on breakfast spread that, that occurs at the Garces family household around seven o'clock. There can be anything from pancakes to arepas to waffles to sheared eggs. Um, can I bring it? <laughs> sure. And so it's, um, that's a meal where I think uh, you know creativity comes into play, and um, 
and we, I have fun connecting with them on that, that level too. So real quick, how much of a role has technology and social media played you know, in your restaurants and how do you feel about that these days? Uh, well, I think it's, it's changed the way we market our restaurants quite a bit and there's a whole, uh, you know, I think 10 years ago there was a way a marketing team or program would occur for a set of restaurants. So that's totally out, yeah. the, out the window at this point. And uh, I think that now as we market our restaurants, there has to be you know, a social media side of things. And um, I think it's really impactful. I think it can, it can really do good for those on the, kind of on the fly stories, things that are like happening now. And um, I, I'm curious to see it's how, how it will go in the future. It's, um, it's always changing, evolving. And uh, from a business side, I think it could be a great tool. So do you have a G Plus account? Uh, <laughs> I believe so, yeah. Okay, great answer, perfect. Okay, yes. So I have two more questions. What's your sure. favorite midnight snack or anything that you go for in your, from your fridge that's always available, always there? Second okay. question, if you want to impress someone with like the best thing they've ever had, like blow their mind, what would you make? Oh, okay, wow, all right. Um, midnight snack. Look at this. I can't be eating at midnight. This is like <laughs> so. Um, but I would say if there's a slice of pizza in the fridge, I'm a pizza fanatic. That'll be something that we're always ordering pizza. There's, there's usually a couple slices in there, so I'll, I'll heat it in the oven and have that. If not, uh, a piece of fruit will be suffice too. Um, but I think let me go to your next question. So blow somebody something I would cook. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. I've been married for 10 years now, so I haven't had to go that route in some time. Usually we'll, <laughs> we'll go somewhere, but um, let me think about this for a minute. Um, so, you know, I, <laughs> that's a good question. You, you caught, my wife's going to kill me on this one. <laughs> um, I think uh, I'm a fan of raw fish, so going out and finding like, uh, and we have access to, to great ingredients. So possibly maybe some um, tuna toro or otoro with caviar. Um, I really enjoy having a true caviar experience once in a while. You know, a lot of times you'll get caviar and it's in small, small doses. If you can swing it, get a get nice, a get, a, get a big tin, get some uh, brioche toast points, a nice bottle of champagne and just, indulge. So in your restaurants, um, do you focus on uh, sustainable fish? Uh, yes, it's, it's not, it hasn't been a primary focus, okay. but we, we certainly like to uh, practice sustainability in terms of seafood. Okay. Yeah. All right, yes. Uh, just because I, I like the questions to keep putting you on the spot. Uh, you're on Iron <laughs> Chef, they're about to pull the tablecloth back and reveal the secret ingredient. What is the like best dream ingredient you could possibly see under there and what is your worst nightmare to see under there? <laughs> best dream ingredient is pork belly because we've been cooking it for years now. We have it, we have that set. Uh, I think worst ingredient, I don't know that I have a, like a, an awful one. Uh, I'm a fan of all ingredients and I think my job for the last 20 years was learn how to take something from a raw state and make it delicious. So there's nothing really that uh, would offend me. Stinky tofu, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Jelly beans. Jelly beans. Uh, you know, when they start incorporating like candy and like weird stuff into the show, it kind of offends me. You're right. Yeah. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Yes. Hi. Hey there. Um, one of the challenges I've always had um, trying to follow a recipe um, is not having all the ingredients. Um, so, for example, um, um, smoked Spanish sweet paprika is not something that I would have in my cupboard. Yeah. Um, so I would I find myself often, you know, substituting or you know altogether skipping an ingredient. 
Um, as a professional chef, how do you feel about people doing that um, to your very well-crafted recipes? I think that it, it occurs, and I understand that due to time restraints, um, et cetera. But I think you know, in the Latin Road home, we include a sources and substitutions list. So there you'll find where, where to go get the sweet smoked paprika or what to use if you can't find it. So we, we've, we've thought about that. And I think it's, it is important, though, to get the right ingredients because they make or break the dish. You know, one ingredient might like twist it one way or the other. OK, you got this book here. What would you recommend people, what would be the, the first two things they should go make in this book? First two things. OK, um, there is um, the Nikai style ceviche out of, the, um, out of the Peru chapter. It's really tasty, very simple and easy to make. And then uh, I would say the Ecuadorian uh, fritada, which is um, a roast pork and hominy salad. Quite delicious. Yeah, so what was your favorite country on your travels? Like, where did you love the food the most? Mm, good question. Uh, I've been a fan of Spanish cuisine for a long time, and I've, I think I've traveled there the most out of all the countries because you can get such great uh, rustic tapas experiences, as well as this other, like, high-end gastronomic adventure. So. Um, I found that Spain was, was one of the best places. Continues to inspire me. I'm, I'm going back this year, um, this coming year in January, to continue to get inspiration for my newest concept. Okay. And then is there one dish that you were like, oh my god, I have to go to this country and have this dish? Hmm. Yeah, I went, to, um, <coughs> I went to Peru, and I wanted to have the cuy, mm -hmm. which is the um, uh, guinea pig, roast guinea pig, and I've always I've heard about it, and I wanted to just experience it. And uh, what I found was uh, crispy, almost like duck confit, mm -hmm. fatty, but like pretty flavorful meat. And uh, yeah, it was an interesting experience. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks. Any other questions? All right. Well, I know that he uh, has time to sign some books, so thanks for yeah. coming. I really thank you. It. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.